move so fast that we really hit the consonants. And then remember at the end, on page 11, start really soft so we have room to grow. Is that yeah. good? Yeah. yeah. Okay, start really soft on every one of those phrases. What am I missing? Oh, hey, how are you? Hello. Good to see you.
that last bell just about exactly when the timer was hitting zero. That is amazing. My name is Brad Olson. Um, well, I'm the head Jesus follower here, and welcome to worship at Loveland United Methodist Church. It's good to have you here. Today, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is Jesus saying, you are the light of the world. And so to get you thinking a little bit about light, I brought some lights here with us. This is a lamp that's usually in my office. I made this lamp, by the way, when I am, was in elementary school, and it's still surviving. Lamp, you know, you guys know how they work. You turn them on, and they bring light to the room. This is a candle. Don, if you're looking for the candle that's usually in our family room, Don professionally makes candles for a living, and so I thought it was appropriate to bring a candle. And then out of our kitchen drawer, of course, you've got a flashlight. All light, right? But all a little bit different. Each shines in their own particular way. So I thought I'd use that as a way of um, beginning to get you thinking. If Jesus said, you are the light of the world, how do you shine your light in the world? And what is the light that you are shining? How do you let your light shine? That's one of the things we're going to talk about as we look at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount this morning. We're also going to gather around the Lord's table as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. It's good to be able to worship with you this morning. There are some things that we'd like you to know are going on in the life of our church, and to highlight a couple of those, uh, Lisa is going to point our attention to the happenings page and get us started with our call to worship. Good morning, everybody. If you'll open your bulletin, I want to draw your attention to our connection card that we have in there every week. This is so you can note your presence. We know you are here. There's a place on the back for a prayer request if you have any, and this can go in the offering plate or it can go in the, um, the little treasure chest by the door afterwards. There's also a QR code on the bottom. You can use your um, smartphone to sign in as well. This week we have a pink insert for our needs as far as volunteer go, volunteers go. Please look at this. We would love to have you serve with us. And as far as the happenings go, I have two guest speakers today. The first one I would like to call up is Mr. Don Whiteside. And um, he is going to talk to us about a new thing we have going on called Thankful Thursdays. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> we uh, started a new ministry uh, back in November called Thankful Thursdays. And what Thankful Thursdays are is uh, we uh, give away a free meal to anybody that wants it uh, once a month. We uh, target uh, families, working families, because they're, they're busy, busy, busy. Um, and I wanted to just give you a, an update on this. Uh, before I do, though, I've got to draw attention to the staff because uh, there's a lot of moving parts in this. And without uh, Sharon and Lisa, and Jennifer's help, uh, this wouldn't happen. So th thank you, ladies. Um, also, we have a, a, a core of uh, dedicated volunteers that have been there to help me with this, and I want to thank them as well. If you are interested in helping uh, with this, just contact me, uh, and we will get you set up. But uh, a little update. We uh, started this. We uh, do this with a grant that was given to us by the West Ohio Conference, um, and uh, we started this in November. We put it out there. We put it out there on our Facebook page. We put it out there on the Loveland uh, UMC.org page. Uh, we also, uh, Jennifer even made a little QR code that people can uh, snap, and it'll take them, link them right to it, uh, to our sign-up page. We opened the sign-ups the week before. They opened today, as a matter of fact and they will go through next Sunday. Uh, we take the information, uh, that information is their name, their phone number, what time they wanna pick up the meal and how many meals, and we consolidate all that, and then we uh, put in the food order, et cetera, et cetera. So to give you an idea of how this has gone, in uh, November, we had 35 meals ordered, uh, and uh, of that, 23 were picked up. Uh, we had, uh, in December, we had 54 meals ordered and 43 were picked up. Now, uh, last month in January, we had 63 meals ordered and 62 were picked up. Um, 
and, and that uh, goes back to the staff because uh, when we first started, uh, we, would, we would, would ding them. Once they, they enrolled, they'd get a ding co confirmation saying, hey, you've signed up for this. And then the second month, we got them not only that, that initial confirmation, but we got them one uh, right next to the day when they were to pick up the meals. And then last month, we were able, you know how y'all got that text? Hey, we have text now, right? We were able to uh, text them the day of the meals. And so that's why we had almost all of them picked up. So uh, we also, uh, we partner with uh, Nest and with the Loveland Food Pantry on this. They hand out uh, our little flyers to uh, their clients. Also, there's a stack of these uh, out. Uh, Jennifer's got them out there. So if you want to uh, pick up some of these uh, and hand them out to your friends, relatives, or neighbor, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, we'd also like to draw your attention to the Found House Interfaith Housing Network. I think there's a table set out out in the lobby, and Ken Spiker is your contact for that. So if you have any questions about that, please talk to Ken. It's a really neat thing going on with there. And I have another guest speaker um, for our Fuel Pancake Fundraiser, Mr. Pax Dellinger. Good morning. I am Pax. I am your youth director, corraller of teenagers. Um, we have 20, that's right, 20 teenagers between 7th and 12th grade enrolled this year, which is wonderful. Um, I'm often asked, if we have 20 teenagers enrolled, where are they? Um, well, first of all, if you are part of our youth group, please stand up. There they are. Uh, a lot of times, because we run um, middle school and high school Sunday school and um, d different classes like uh, confirmation downstairs during service, you guys don't get to see these guys. You can, you can sit back down if you want. Um, so uh, we like to take some, uh, some chances throughout the year to remind you that we are a, a flourishing uh, department here, and these guys are fantastic. Uh, I'll try not to choke myself up speaking up here. What do they do? Well, a lot of times they are uh, behind the scenes doing all kinds of things, uh, both for the church and for the community. Um, so, for example, just in the past year, you wouldn't believe how active these guys have been. Now, mind you, this is in between school and extracurriculars and, and all of their busyness, um, and they stay busy uh, uh, serving the community. We uh, go on a remote mission trip every year. We go, the last two years, it's been at uh, our uh, longtime uh, partner, uh, Henderson Settlement. Uh, they go on spiritual retreats. They serve in local capacities. Um, they uh, have done things like adopt a family for Christmas time. They've done things like 30-hour famines. If you want to see these guys, now again, they're either downstairs or at their weekend jobs or soccer camp or show choir on Sundays. It's hard to, uh, uh, to find them, but if you really want to see these guys, uh, come on uh, some of the mission work days for the church. They're here, and they're here every time. They're here at Vacation Bible School. They're here at Trunk or Treat. They're here at the fall and spring cleanups. Uh, they're here at Living Nativity. They're here, and they're a big part of the, uh, the volunteerism that happens with those programs. So you want to get to know these guys, come on those days. Uh, we are having a, uh, an annual fundraiser. We've done this for many, many years. You guys will recall for the last three years, uh, uh, we've done um, a, a uh, Create Your Own Pancakes at Home kit. Uh, this is in honor of Shrove Tuesday. And you know what? We met as a group. We met as a church staff. Don, you're going to like this one, man. We've decided let's bring it back in-house and let's actually do a community pancake dinner. So we would love to see everyone sitting here and your friends. We're going to do this. We decided to do this 
uh, for your convenience, uh, just following service the Sunday before Shrove Tuesday. So save the date, February 19th, noon, right after we finish up up here, come downstairs. We'll have uh, this beloved youth group preparing your meals, serving your meals, um, and it'll give you a chance to interact with them. The, the donations we welcome, and these proceeds actually help pay for all of these activities that I just listed. Um, and that's a great help too. I, you know, I have to uh, say this, all of these activities which are very fulfilling and also serve this church and this uh, community, this, uh, the aggregate of this can be several hundred dollars per kid. So what we're trying to do there, there is give them a hand to stay involved and that's where your donations will go. So uh, check this out, there's a, uh, there's, uh, there's a stack of flyers, Jennifer's holding them up right there, they're on the table out there to remind you of the date and then uh, here's one of those uh, nifty QR codes. You guys know about these things? You just pop it with your phone camera and it takes you right to the link to donate. That means that you can donate any time uh, that you would like, whether you come to the brunch or not, but we'd love to see you at the brunch. Thank you. There's a lot going on around here. And the last highlight I want to give you is that we're going to be singing the first hymn after the call to worship. And it's something maybe unfamiliar, so we're going to encourage you to use your hymnals for this one. Do you have a, a hymn number, Sharon? 206. So we're fast approaching that time. All right, we're going to do the call to worship. It is interactive. Seek the Lord who now is present, call upon the Lord who is near. Let them return that the Lord may have mercy on them, that our God may abundantly pardon. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not, but water the earth, it shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that which I intend and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And this is the word of the Lord. And if you'll all please stand, we're going to do, um, we're going to pass the peace this morning. Welcome your neighbor to the service. And um, then after that, we're going to sing.
you're wondering what it means to be a Jesus follower, there have been a number of attempts to kind of consolidate <laughs> that and encapsulate it, and one of the best known is the Apostles' Creed. Will you join with me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, fiction of the and life everlasting. Amen. Shelley Wilson, and our first scripture reading is Isaiah 58, 9 through 12. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. He, you will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. 
You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the old foundations. You will be called repairer of the broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. This is the word of the Lord. Congregational prayer is either printed in the bulletin or on the screen. Let us pray. Lord, set your blessing on us as we begin this day together. Confirm in us the truth by which we rightly live. Confront us with the truth from which we wrongly turn. We ask not for what we want, but for what you know we need. We offer this day and ourselves for you and to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Good morning. My name is Emily. I'm the worship leader here at LUMC. So good to be back with you. Uh, I've been a little sick. The voice is not quite back, but I hear you guys singing those hymns, so sing loud. <laughs> I'd like to invite you to stand as we worship together, but uh, please worship however you're comfortable.
you go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the hate of my enemy. You come back and you call it my. go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness. And all I did
children's moment. Let's have all the kids come up to the front row. Good to see everybody today. Thank you for bringing that song to us. Wow. Let me ask the adults in the room, what is a job that you have or that you've had in the past? Just say it out. What's a job that you've had? Hairdresser? Nobody works? <laughs> Lawyer, just say them out loud, nice and loud. Okay. Lots of different. Oh, that's a popular one, tax collector. So you kids here, when you, right now, if someone said to you, what do you want to do when you grow up? What kind of job do you want to have? What would you say? What are some of your thoughts? Do you know yet? Have you thought about it? Teacher. What, ma'am? A truck driver. Any other ideas? A therapist. We talk about Paul a lot in Sunday school. We talk about Paul a lot in church. Paul the Apostle had a huge influence on the fact that there are Christians in this world at all. Do you know Paul just wasn't an apostle? Think about it. He had to have money. He had to make a living. He had to buy food and have a place to live and travel around. Do you know what Paul did? You know what his job was? He, he not th that was a different th disciple. Paul was a tent maker. Do you know that? I think that's kind of cool. Paul was a tent maker. You might think, why do people make need tents? Well, one of the reasons I know of is the Jewish people in particular. They had these different festivals they went to every year, and they traveled from their home. It was almost kind of like a camp out. They were going someplace they didn't live, and so a lot of them had these tents, these shelters. Now, you know, at home, have you ever made a tent out of a sheet? I have. I'm not going to open this all the way up because it is ginormous. We are going to make a tent out of this downstairs. But I just brought it along just to say this is like our play pretend kind of a tent. It just keeps going and going. But this was one of the most fun things that I did when I was a kid. My grandma would put like a tablecloth or a sheet or a bunch of things over table and chairs. And I'd get underneath it. There's something about being inside a tent that's just kind of fun. You can pretend you're someplace else. It feels kind of cozy. So we're going to do that today, but we're going to do that for the purpose of talking about Paul. Paul made tents for people, not, not to play in, but to use as shelters, to sleep in when they went to places or when they traveled for their business, whatever it might be. We are, in a way, all tent makers. Because no matter what job we have or had or what job we will have, everything that we do, God puts us in a place where we can talk about Jesus with other people. So you may not be a tent maker, maybe you're going to be a truck driver, maybe you're going to be a teacher, maybe you're a tax collector, whatever you are. You still have an opportunity through every one of those jobs to tell people about the gospel, to tell people about Jesus. So keep in mind that whatever your job is, no matter if you're doing it now or you've done it before, you'll do it in the future, always think of yourself as a tent maker. You're making a place to have a conversation with people about Jesus. And I promise you that if you look for those times, God will give you those opportunities. All right. Come on up, kids. Let's do our prayer together. We'll be real careful. Pastor Brad's table over there. Here we go. Here we go, buddy. All right. Get in real close. Come on. There we go. Okay, let's all pray together. Father, thank you all the things you teach us through your word. Thank you all the lessons that we learn and all the love that you share with us. Thank you that you've made the Bible real to us so that we know that the people then are just like us now, and you want every one of your children to share your message of love and the hope of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for these kids that will continue to grow up and do that very thing. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Barb, and our second reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today's words of Jesus come to us from very early in the greatest sermon ever shared, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, um, crowds of people have gathered together on a grassy hillside to hear Jesus teach. And just before that, if we'd begun at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus has started out by saying, if you are poor in spirit, you are blessed. If you are mourning a loss, you are blessed. If you are merciful, you are blessed. If you are a peacemaker, you are blessed. If you are pure in heart, you are blessed. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you are blessed. If you're persecuted for my sake, yours is the kingdom of heaven. I imagine people at this point to be saying, all right, I feel loved, I feel forgiven, I'm all in. I want to be a Jesus follower. Sign me up. How do I do that? What does it look like? And so then Jesus goes on to say, well, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. But in case some people there thought, well, maybe that means I don't need to follow the law because I thought what you were going to talk about is being obedient and following the rules. Jesus says, let's get this clear. Salt and light people don't break rules. Instead, they know them so well they fulfill them like I have fulfilled them. I've come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. All right, are you ready to dig into that a little bit deeper? Jesus started out by saying, you are the salt of the earth. There's a couple things that I know about salt, and here's one of them. Salt has been used through times in times as a preservative. So if you take like a little piece of meat and you cure it in salt, you end up with, do you know? Jerky, right? And do you know what the shelf life of jerky is? Like forever. Have you ever known jerky to go bad? Jesus is saying, be like that. Keep the faith. Here's another thing I know about salt. Most of us use it to season things, right? To add flavor to whatever it is that, that we're preparing. And so if you have a little bit of soup and it's kind of bland and you want to spice it up a little bit, you add some salt, right? If you're eating celery, celery is mostly water, and you want to add a little bit of taste to it, my family, I think, growing up used to add salt to celery. If you're eating a piece of meat and you want to give it a little bit more flavor than it has, what do you do? Add some salt and some pepper. So Jesus is saying this is our job as Jesus followers, to add flavor to the world, to spice up the world. What's wrong with that? What's so radical about that? Well, as soon as you try to flavor up the world, somebody's going to come along and think that what you're doing is distasteful, right? Everybody's got different tastes, right? So somebody's not going to like whatever flavor you're serving up. Many of you know, or maybe you don't, I'm more of a ketchup type person. I don't like a whole lot of spice in my food. Um, every now and then, you probably do know this about me, I like to go and I like to get lunch down at Subway. 
And every now and then when they're making my sandwich, they'll throw like a jalapeno pepper in there by mistake. You know what I do when they do that? I catch it right away. I'm more of a mayonnaise and ketchup. Anyway, I pull it out. That's what a lot of people will do if you go about trying to spice up the world and add flavor to it. They'll try to pick it out. Pick out the, the spice and the flavor in your life. Some of you may know that in just under a month, I'm competing in my next weightlifting competition. I'll be competing in the Arnold Classic on March 3rd. And one of the things that I do to get ready for a competition is I try to make training as much like competition as possible. So, for example, you have to compete in what's basically a wrestling singlet. My wrestling singlet has USA right boldly across the front. I lift most of the time over at Lifetime Fitness in Mason, and they've kind of gotten used to me lifting over there. But this week, I was doing Board of Ordained Ministry interviews of people who want to be pastors up in Columbus. Now, Lifetime is a chain, so there were a number of different Lifetimes up there. So I went to train at one of the other Lifetimes up in Columbus. They're not used to me yet. <laughs> There's not a lot of people, especially guys, walking around in wrestling singlets. One of the trainers actually came up to me and said, um, would you like to borrow some appropriate workout clothes? <laughs> My point is this, as soon as you try to add flavor to the world, as soon as you try to spice things up, somebody will come along and try to pick it out of you. Don't let that happen. Don't let the world pick the flavor, the taste, out of your life. That's what I think Jesus is saying. All right, let's push this metaphor a little more, and let's add in some science. Do you know what the chemical formula for salt is? Sodium chloride, right? Do you know that sodium by itself is very unstable and highly reactive? And do you all know, also know that chlorine by itself is a gas? It's a poisonous gas. It's what gives, I think, ammonia, that, that awful smell, so that you know when there's ammonia in the room. So by themselves, they can be kind of dangerous and even poisonous. But you put them together, and you get common table salt. I like to think of that as kind of a metaphor for truth and love. Truth and love taken by themselves can be difficult. If you take love all by itself, it can be blind and really unpredictable. If you take truth all by itself, it can be really judgmental and condemning. But you put them together, and if you have truth and love, if you can speak the truth in love, then you have the gospel, right? I think that's what Jesus is saying, or means when he says, your righteousness needs to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Not just that you need to know what the rules are and follow them, but that you also need to be able to speak the truth in love. Truth and love go together. All right, let's see if we can push this a little bit further. Do you know how salt flavors food? It doesn't bring attention to itself, does it? At least not if you flavor something right. You don't say, wow, that really tastes like good salt. You think, that really tastes like good food. Or in other words, it brings out the flavor in the food. It dissolves into whatever it is you're cooking and brings out the flavor in whatever it is that you're eating. Boy, there's a challenge for us as believers, isn't it? What if our job is to lose ourselves in what we're doing to lose ourselves in the work that we're doing of the Lord and bring out the best in the world around us. Do you remember the last time you lost yourself in what you were doing? Do you remember the last time that you lost yourself in serving the Lord? There's a person by the name of Rebecca Prickett who wrote a book called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. It was appropriate enough that I thought I had to pick it up and look it through again as long as I was talking on the subject of salt. And so I read through it again and found this illustration. It's about a young man named Bill who was a college student, brilliant college student, who became a believer, accepted Christ into his life. And one morning, one Sunday morning, he got up and he decided, if I'm going to be a Jesus follower, maybe I ought to go to church. So he found a church just off campus. Now he dressed like a college kid. 
He didn't like wearing shoes. I'm assuming this was a warmer part of the country. Didn't like wearing socks. Wore jeans. I don't know, are they really jeans if they're all ripped? And t-shirts. That's what he wore, so that's what he wore to church. He walked into church, and the church was so full there wasn't a room and probably, or a seat, and probably because of the way he was dressed, nobody scooted over to allow him a seat either. So here's what he did. He walked right down the middle aisle of the church and sat right on the carpet in front of the church. Made sense to him. Now, there was kind of an awkward pause and then an old man in the back of the church got up, and things got even more tense. I like this story because I can imagine it happening here. The old man started walking forward towards where Bill was sitting in the middle of the aisle, and then grabbed hold of the pew and lowered himself down onto the ground and spent the entire worship service sitting there so he wouldn't have to sit alone in the worship service. Don't you love that? Our job is to flavor the world. I think it was um, William Purdy who once said, you've got to dance like no one's watching. You've got to sing like no one's listening. You've got to love like you've never been hurt, and you've got to live like it's the kingdom on earth. Don't you like that? All right, so if there's an idea of a ministry that you have that you think might be a little bit out there and a little bit strange to some people, I think what Jesus is saying is go for it. Other people will pick at you. You can count on that. Don't let them win. Don't let them pick the spice out of your life. Find something that you can pour yourself entirely into. All right, I think that's an easy enough phrase of Jesus for you to um, remember. So will you turn to a person next to you and tell them, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. All right, then Jesus went on, and he said, you are the light of the world. Now, remember that in the first century, light wouldn't have been as easy to come by as it is these days. There wasn't electricity, so you couldn't just flip the switch on the wall. Um, there weren't matches, and so you couldn't just light a candle. And so before you put a light out, you would have thought rather carefully about what, how you were going to get it lit again. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. What's so radical about that? Well, here's the problem with light. As soon as you turn light on or light a candle, it casts a shadow, doesn't it? And what some people see is not the light or the whatever it is that's being lit up, but instead they see the shadow that is cast. And everything casts a shadow, doesn't it? So, for example... If you're smart, the shadow side is people, somebody will think that you're a know-it-all. If you're confident, the shadow side of that is somebody will think that you're arrogant. If you're humble, the shadow side of that is that somebody will want to take advantage of that. So I think it is a radical challenge for Jesus to say, you are the light of the world. And let's look at a particularity, a peculiarity of this verse. Notice that Jesus doesn't say you are a light of the world. He doesn't say let your light shine. What does he say? He says you are the light of the world. Let the light shine. The light that began in the beginning when God said let there be light, that's the light that we are to let shine. The light that is in Christ, that's the light that we are to let shine. Now, that's an important distinction that I think we need to make these days because so often these days we talk a lot about letting, speaking your truth. And there, it's hard to distinguish these days what the truth is because there are so many different versions of it anymore. So here we're not talking just about there being a relative truth. We're talking about there being an ultimate truth. That's an idea that we don't often hear a whole lot of. But let's see. It's a complicated idea, so let's see if I can find a simpler way of illustrating it. I have a mayonnaise jar here full of Jolly Rogers, Jolly Ranchers. Obviously, I don't eat them. I put them in a jar. <laughs> How many Jolly Ranchers do you think are in this jar? Any guesses? A lot? 117. 
217. 317. A thousand. Fifty? Sixty. I should auction these off, shouldn't I? Here's my point that I'm trying to illustrate. Ultimately, there is an answer, isn't there? We could take them out and we could count and there would be a number that would be the answer to the question of how many Jolly Ranchers are there in that. So we all have our own individual versions of what the answer might be, but there is a right answer. I think that's what Jesus is saying when he's saying, you are the light of the world. The challenge is not just to shine our light to let who we are come out, but to shine the truth that is in Jesus Christ. I think that's what Jesus is saying when you are the light of the world. There's a woman by the name of Marilyn Voss Savant, who is the smartest woman who has ever lived, smartest person who's ever lived, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. She has the highest IQ of anybody who's ever been tested for, she has 180 I6 IQ. I think she lives up in the Indi Indianapolis area. Most of her life, she's written a column, now a podcast. I love, by the way, that the smartest person who's ever lived, last name is Savant. <laughs> Obviously, there's a, um, some gene, gene um, going on there. Anyway, one of the questions that she was once asked in this column was, what's the most powerful idea that you've ever encountered? Good question to ponder, isn't it? What's the most powerful idea that you've ever encountered? This was her answer. Her answer was truth, that there is a truth. There are so many different versions of the truth, she said, but ultimately there is the truth. I like that answer, don't you? Jesus said, you are the light, and notice that he said, you are the light of the world. And so the idea of being the light is that our job is to bring out the best in the people around us. So the idea is that by being the light, if we smile more, other people around us will be more happy. If we are more confident, other people around us will, will feel more confident. If we are more honest, other people around us will be more likely to tell the truth. If we are serving, other people will be more likely also to want to serve. Jesus said it this way, you are the light of the world. I think that's easy enough to expect you to remember. You've already turned to somebody on one side of you. Will you turn to somebody on the other side of you? Tell them, you are the light of the world. All right, one last thought. I imagine Jesus to have been looking out on that crowd and to have seen somebody who is thinking, this is really good. This changes everything. And it's true, Jesus did change some things. For example, there were rules about what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. But Jesus said, Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man and opened up the rules about the Sabbath. There were lots of rules about what you could and couldn't eat, what was clean and what was unclean. And Jesus said, no, what's important is not what goes in your mouth, but what comes out. Change the dietary laws at the time. There were rules about who you were and weren't supposed to be associating with. And Jesus, radical guy that he was, ate with sinners and changed those rules. And so I imagine him to be looking out on that crowd and seeing somebody who was saying, all right, so we don't have to worry about the rules anymore. To which Jesus says, no, salt and light people love the law so much that not only do they follow it, but they want to follow the intent of the law and they want to get to know the lawmaker. They want to be in a relationship with not just the law, but the one who gives the law. There's a challenging idea, isn't it? Jesus said it this way. He says, I, not, I come not to abolish the law and the prophets. I come instead to fulfill the law and the prophets. Speaking about rules and following the rules, I um, read a story about an English teacher who is teaching high school English. And she decided at the beginning of her class that she wanted to start out and set some ground rules. This was the way she started her class. She said, all right, folks, 
none of us knows the entire truth, and so we're going to listen to each other when we have dialogue in our class. Are there any questions? One very bright young lady in the front of the class, her name was Elizabeth, raised her hand and says, yes, I have a question. I don't see how those two thoughts go together. She said, if nobody has the entire truth, then why should we listen to each other? To which the teacher said, well, that's a little bit arrogant, isn't it? To not listen to each other? To which she said, no, actually, I think it's kind of arrogant to think that nobody knows the truth. I mean, have you surveyed everybody in the world? Have you tested them to see who knows what? It's kind of judgmental to say nobody knows the truth. Might it not be a better idea to say, well, I have some true things that I would like to share, and maybe you have some true things that you'd like to share, and maybe that's the reason that we ought to be listening to each other, to figure out what the truth is. To which the um, teacher, after the conversation was kind of winding down, said, well, this is going to be an interesting class, isn't it? And Elizabeth said, ain't that the truth? <laughs> I like that. If you're feeling like the world is a very dark place, Jesus says, don't forget to shine your light. If you are feeling like the world is full of sin, Jesus says, remember that ultimately our job is not to follow all the rules, but instead to know that we are forgiven. If you're feeling like you're wondering what the truth is, remember that Jesus says the truth is not ultimately a set of rules, and it's not even an idea. Do you know this verse? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth ultimately is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. All right, I think that verse is important enough to remember. You've turned to somebody on your left side, and you've turned to somebody on your right side, so this time will you turn to somebody either in front or behind you and tell them, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's not easy, and so we're going to need some nourishment, and so we gather around the Lord's table to be nourished and to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. For the last several thousand years, it's begun with a greeting that goes something like this. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is praised among all peoples. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, who will forever sing this hymn of glory to your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, Almighty One, and blessed are you, Jesus Christ. In the power of the Spirit, you created all things, blessed them, and called them good. You called to yourself a people to make mercy and truth known in all the world. And when we betrayed your calling, you were faithful. We wandered from the way, and you called us to return and led us home. And still we turned from your ways, abused your creatures, and made ourselves slaves to sin and death. And so at the right time you came to dwell among us as one of us, bringing good news to the poor, healing to the sick, raising the dead, sharing table with the unrighteous, and teaching the way that leads to life. By your incarnation, life, suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which um, Jesus gave himself up for us, he gathered together with his disciples. And we know that during that meal, one of the things that he did was he took bread. He gave thanks to God, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Towards the end of that meal, we also know that Jesus took a cup. 
He gave thanks to God and he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so in remembrance of these God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. I'd like to invite you to join together with me in a time of prayer, and um, some of those that we've been invited to remember in prayer are the, um, the Oreo family. Um, Gigi, can I say this, has, has said that her cousins Guy and Claude, who are brothers, have passed away just six days apart, and so the Oreo family would very much appreciate you remembering them in our prayers. Will you join with me in prayer? Let us pray. Merciful God, you call us to be salt and light, to live as your righteous and holy people. We want to, Lord, but we fall short. We confess that there is both good and bad, light and dark within our own hearts. We want to do what's right, but our fears and anxieties often lead us to self-protection rather than vulnerability and hoarding rather than freely sharing, to self-righteousness rather than compassion. Forgive us, O God. Restore us by your mercy that having received the gift of your infinite love, we might turn to our neighbors and give your love away. For the sake of Christ, we offer these and all of our prayers. Pray out, pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the very body and blood of Christ. Make them and make us, through them, Christ's body alive in the world. Let your kingdom come. For we offer these and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught the disciples once and who teaches us still to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There are some who have agreed to help in the serving of this meal. I'd like to invite you to join with me up front at this time. All right, we have four choices of where you can head next. There are three serving stations, and we also have the guaranteed COVID safe prepackaged bread and wine. In the United Methodist Church, we practice an open table, which means anybody is welcome to receive these signs of God's grace. They are offered because of who God is, not because of what we've done to deserve it, and there is nothing you can do to not deserve it. And so, since the meal's ready and the table's prepared, I invite you to come as you will and receive these signs of God's grace.
Thank you, Joan. Sometimes there's just too much material to fit in a sermon, and here's a nuance of that, you are the light of the world, that often go, is lost in translation. The you is plural. When Jesus says, you are the light of the world, around here we might better translate that, that y'all are the light of the world. Or in other words, it's not something that we're left to do on our own, it's something that we do together. And one of the ways that we do that in supporting of the work of the Lord through Loveland United Methodist Church is through our financial gifts. And so I'd like to invite you to stand and join together in singing our closing hymn. And as you do, our ushers are going to come forward and they're going to take the offering baskets and pass it amongst us. Thank you in advance for your generous giving.
Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Go to add flavor to the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Go to let the light shine in your life. Go to thirst for justice and righteousness. Go in peace to serve the Lord. And the people of God all said, Amen. Amen.